Okay, we are ready to continue with Stuart Little. Stuart Little, Chapter 12, The Schoolroom. While Dr. Carey was making repairs on the car, remember the car, the little in, little mouse-sized car went flying off into his office and it got all mangled up and ruined and they had to get it fixed. So Dr. Stewart was making repairs on the car. Stewart went shopping. He decided that since he was about to take a long motor trip, he should have the proper clothes. He went to a doll shop where they had things were, which were the right size for him and outfitted himself completely with new luggage, suits, shirts, and accessories. He charged everything and was well pleased with his purchases. That night, he slept at the doctor's apartment. So you can see him there looking at himself in the mirror with his new clothes. The next morning, Stuart started early to avoid traffic. He thought it would be a good idea to get out on the road before there were too many cars and trucks. He drove through Central Park to 110th Street, then over to the West Side Highway, then north to the Saw Mill River Parkway. The car ran beautifully, and although people were inclined to stare at him, Stuart didn't mind. He was very careful not to press the button, which had caused so much trouble the day before. Do you remember what the button does? Makes the car invisible. He made up his mind that he would never use that button again. Just as the sun was coming up, Stuart saw a man seated in thought by the side of the road. Stuart steered his car alongside, stopped, and put his head out. You can see the man sitting right there. You're worried about something, aren't you? asked Stuart. Yes, I am, said the man, who was tall and mild. Can I help you in any way? asked Stuart in a friendly voice. The man shook his head. It's an impossible situation, I guess, he replied. You see... I'm the superintendent of schools in this town. That's the person that's in charge of the whole school district, like our Mr. Harper. That's not an impossible situation, said Stuart. It's bad, but it's not impossible. Well, continued the man, I've always got problems that I can't solve. Today, for instance, one of my teachers is sick. Miss Gunderson, her name is. She teaches number seven school. I've got to find a substitute for her, a teacher who will take her place. What's the matter with her? Asked Stuart. I don't know exactly. The doctor says she may have rhinestones, said the superintendent. Can't you find another teacher? Asked Stuart. No, that's the trouble. There's nobody in this town who knows anything. No spare teachers know anything. School is supposed to begin in an hour. I will be glad to take Miss Gunderson's place for a day if you would like, suggested Stuart agreeably. The superintendent of schools looked up. Really? Certainly, said Stuart. Glad to. He opened the door of the little car and stepped out. Walking around to the rear, he opened the baggage compartment and took out his suitcase. If I'm to conduct a class in a schoolroom, I'd better take off these motoring togs and get into something more suitable, he said. Stuart climbed the bank, went into the bushes, and was back in a few minutes wearing a pepper and salt jacket, old striped trousers, a Windsor tie, and spectacles. Spectacles are glasses. He folded his other clothes and packed them away in the suitcase. Do you think you can maintain discipline? asked the superintendent. That means can he keep order in the classroom? Of course I can, replied Stuart. I'll make the work interesting and the discipline will take care of itself. Don't worry about me. And there you see, it's a good thing he bought all those new clothes, right? He looks like he's ready to go to work. The man thanked him and they shook hands. At quarter before nine, the scholars had gathered in school number seven. When they missed Miss Gunderson and word got round that there would be a substitute, they were delighted. A substitute, somebody whispered to somebody else. A substitute, a substitute. The news traveled far, and soon everyone in the schoolroom knew that they were all to have a rest from Miss Gunderson for at least a day, 
and we're going to have the wonderful experience of being taught by a strange teacher whom nobody had ever seen before. Stuart arrived at nine. He parked his car briskly at the door of the school, stalked boldly into the room, found a yardstick leaning against Miss Gunderson's desk, and climbed hand over hand to the top. There he found an inkwell, a pointer, some pens and pencils, a bottle of ink, some chalk, a bell, two hairpins, and three or four books in a pile. And there you can see the kids standing around, being excited for this new adventure. They don't know what to expect. I wonder what they will think when they see a mouse at the front of the classroom. Can you imagine if I was absent and a mouse took my place? That'd be pretty funny. Stuart scrambled nimbly up to the top of the stack of books and jumped for the button on the bell. His weight was enough to make it ring and Stuart promptly slid down, walked to the front of the desk and said, let me have your attention, please. The boys and girls crowded around the desk to look at the substitute. Everyone talked at once and they seemed to be very much pleased. The girls giggled and the boys laughed, and everyone's eyes lit up with excitement to see such a small and good-looking teacher so appropriately dressed. Let me have your attention, please, repeated Stuart. As you know, Miss Gunderson is sick, and I am taking her place. What's the matter with her? asked Roy Hart eagerly. There you can see Stuart on top of the desk. See how he climbed up the, room, the yardstick? And you see the bell right there? He jumped on top of the bell to get their attention. Vitamin trouble, replied Stuart. She took vitamin D when she needed A. She took B when she was short of C, and her system became overloaded with ribofl riboflavin, thiamine hydrochloride, and even with pyroxidine, the need for which in human nutrition has not been established. Let it be a lesson for all of us. He glared fiercely at the children and they made no more inquiries about Miss Gunderson. Everyone will now take his or her seat, commanded Stuart. The pupils filed obediently down the aisles and dropped into their seats. And in a moment, there was silence in the classroom. Stuart cleared his throat, seizing a coat lapel in e either hand to make himself look like a professor, Stuart began. You can see the kids. They, he certainly has their attention, doesn't he? So another word for students, a synonym for students. Did you hear one? Might have been kind of a funny word. Where is it? Here it is. Pupils is a synonym for students. Pupils are also that center part of your eyeball, the pupils, the black part but pupils can also mean students. Anybody absent, Stuart said. The scholars shook their heads. Anybody late, they shook their heads. Very well, said Stuart. What's the first subject you usually take up in the morning? Arithmetic, shouted the children. Do you know what subject that is? Arithmetic means math. Bother arithmetic, snapped Stuart. Let's skip it. There were wild shouts of enthusiasm at this suggestion. Everyone in the class seemed perfectly willing to skip arithmetic for one morning. What next do you study? asked Stuart. Spelling, cried the children. Well, said Stuart, a misspelled word is an abomination in the sight of everyone. That means spelling is very important. I consider it a very fine thing to spell words correctly, and I strongly urge every one of you to buy a Webster's Collegiate Dictionary and consult it whenever you are in the slightest doubt. Okay, so he wants them all to get a dictionary and make sure if they are not sure how to spell a word, they should look it up in the dictionary. We've practiced that a lot this year. So much for spelling. What's next? The scholars were just as pleased to be let out of spelling as they were about arithmetic. And they shouted for joy and everybody looked at everybody else and laughed and waved handkerchiefs and rulers and some of the boys threw spitballs at some of the girls. Stuart had to climb under the pile of books again and dive for the bell to restore order. What's next, he repeated. 
Writing, cried the scholars. Goodness, said Stuart in disgust. Don't you children know how to write yet? Certainly we do, yelled one and all. So much for that then, cried Stuart. Social studies comes next. We will continue in the next.